this is Matt Winston, and I am here with Mike Elizalde, uh, creative director and co-owner and president mm -hmm. of Spectral Motion, and good friend and magician, <laughs> and we'll talk about that a little later. And yes. we're here today to discuss uh, he and his team's involvement with Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark, which uh, is coming out in a few days. When you hear this podcast, it'll already be out. Uh, it's produced and co-written by our, our, our god, Guillermo yes. del Toro, uh -huh. uh, directed by Andre Overdahl, yes. um, who also worked on uh, Troll Hunters, yes. mm -hmm. as well as others. Screenplay by Dan and Kevin Hageman, uh, and based on the iconic uh, book series by Alvin Schwartz, uh, with incredible illustrations by Stephen Gamble. Yep. So, what a dream project for a monster fan, right? Unbelievable. It's so cool to be involved with something like this on so many levels. I mean, this this is a series of books that I remember, my kids remember, as terrifying. You know, the, the imagery alone, just those images. If you never read the stories, which we did, but if you didn't read the stories and you only saw the images, they were burned into your subconscious forever because they're they're so frightening you know they have they have a primal kind of quality that that reaches into your soul and says there's something very wrong going on here and you can't unsee this you know so right away when i heard that they were making a film it's like oh my gosh i hope i hope that they are loyal to to those images and as it turned out with with andre and, and guillermo uh, you know, calling the shots there. They they wanted to be 100% high fidelity to Gamel's work, and uh, and that's where we came in. We started, you know, working uh, uh, out the designs and how they were going going to uh, be practical elements on actors and and how we would present these in in the in the context of the film. So, um, working with Andre was was a huge you know thing for us because several years ago. My son, Eric, was the one who came to me and he said, have you seen this movie called Troll Hunter? And, and, and I'm like, no, I haven't. And he sat me down and he said, we're going to watch this. So we watched the movie together and it was brilliant. It's like, this is really cool. This is great, wonderful Norwegian filmmaking, you know, <laughs> that I really keyed into. I love, I love, uh, I've worked with um, uh, Tommy Workola, who's also from Norway. And there's something different about those guys. They've got this cool vibe about them. And yet they're, they also have this kind of like Viking indestructibility about them, <laughs> you know, the stoic quality. Um, but they have dark humor too, which I love, you know, it's wonderful. So, so the, the prospect of working with him and then add to that Guillermo in the mix, it's like, why wouldn't I do it? You know, this, this was like, this was a dream project. We had Norman Cabrera on the team. We had uh, Mike Hill on the team as, as principal designers. And so uh, it was a dream team, and it was a dream project. Yeah. So that covers sort of the genesis, and you know, fans of your work know that you and Guillermo go back to the first Hellboy. Uh, even further, or was that the yeah, first project? Yeah, we went back a little bit further than that. Um, we first, uh, first worked together on Blade Two. Yeah, yeah. So you guys have a long history, and him approaching you obviously makes makes perfect sense for this. Uh, our next question is going to delve into the specifics of what was asked of you and how those builds went. Was it Starbo, No, no, no. Okay. No. So for my second question, I, I would like to know, um, obviously Guillermo came to you uh, along with the director, Andre. Uh, you were very relieved to hear they were going to stick to Stephen Gamble's iconic designs, and why wouldn't you? They are so frightening. And if you can bring that into three dimensions, you've won. They're so scary. Um, what was the, the, the menu of things that you were going to be called on to make in that, in that first approach? What makeups, what characters uh, were, were on your task list? So when they first came to us, Guillermo and, and Andre, uh, they, they gave us a, 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 a list of the characters that they wanted us to create. And uh, all of them, except for one, uh, were iconic characters from the series that you know everyone remembers and, and recognizes. Uh, one was Harold the Scarecrow, and we also had the Pale Lady, the the, the woman in the hallway. We had the um, let's see, uh, the one that was not iconic was the Jangly Man. 
and uh, and then we had the Tolis Corpse. So those were our four our four uh, builds. All of them were going to be uh, actors in some sort of rig, either prosthetics or a creature suit or something that would have to exactly replicate Gamel's work. Um, so that was that was a wonderful challenge for us. You know, the 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 easy part of it was that the design work was done. We we knew what we had to build. The the challenge was making those illustrations work on a human being and retaining the proportions and and everything everything about it. So, as with any job that we take on in this business, you know, there there's always that moment in in the very beginning where you're kind of thinking, "Gee, we're going to have to make some concessions to make this work." But maybe not. Maybe maybe we can stretch things back and forth until it actually looks like like the drawing, and that's the process that we undertook. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Norman Cabrera uh, was leading the charge on on Harold the Scarecrow and on the Tolis Corpse. Mike Hill was leading uh, the team for the creation of the Pale Lady and uh, Jangly Man, and. Uh, we had a wonderful team working with them. Um, several, several uh, people. Many, too many to mention here, but but uh, we can we can add that information later if you'd like. So uh, it uh, it was it was kind of a quick turnaround too. So we, we we had to we had to work quickly, efficiently, and and nail it. <laughs> so that's uh, that's how it uh, evolved. So let's dig a little deeper into how you translated those Gamel illustrations into the real world. Let's start with Harold the Scarecrow, which you said uh, was led up by Norman Cabrera, brilliant uh, artist who got his start with Rick Baker back in the day and has worked with you throughout the years, k and effects. Um, what was the particular challenge? You said that each of them had, had a challenge. How do you bring an illustration to life and, and keep the feel? What was the challenge of Harold? Uh, from from your recollection? Um, the biggest challenge in bringing Harold uh, into reality was, well, there were a few. Um, but one of them was the fact that if, if you do look at, at Gamel's illustration, it's difficult to tell if we're looking at a person or I'm not really sure what it is that we're looking at. Uh, so with direction from Andre, uh, his, his idea and, and Norman's idea that they came up with was that this character was a construct, obviously, it's a scarecrow, so it was a construct that that was brought together by using lots of different things. Uh, a, a rotting pumpkin for his belly, um, a, a bunch of two-by-fours for his structure and frame. Um, Thank you. A, um, and for the face, which was the trickiest part, how are we going to get this guy to look like this without it being a human being? You know, because he kind of looks human. He has this human qualities, characteristics. So the idea was was brought up by Norman that it should be a, an old rubber mask that, that you bought at a novelty store and was sitting out there rotting in the sun. So that was great. And, and Andre loved the idea. I love the idea. We went with that. And it turned out to be very successful because one of the conceits that Andre had was that he didn't want it to to appear to be a human being, so that when you first saw it, you didn't think, "Well, that's a man. You know, that's a guy, you know, stuck up on this on this stand." And um, the mask really took it away from that, because it did have kind of like that rotting latex quality to it, and and a scary face to start with, you know. So it was pretty. Uh, it was a pretty great great uh, path to take with him. Um, the other challenges were that when he did move. We didn't want it to, to look like human physiognomy. We wanted it to feel like it's still made out of pieces of wood and rope and, and baling wire and whatever, you know, straw. Um, so so uh, we brought on uh, a guy named Bruce, and I'll come back to his last name, uh, to build that, that whole construct of, of how his joints moved. And what he did is he took pieces of foam and he, he made artificial uh, limbs out of this, out of artificial uh, two by fours out of this foam stuff. And it looked beautiful. It looked like old rotting wood. And uh, we, we 
structured it onto the performer's body in such a way that when he moved, uh, those pieces of two by four moved differently than he did. So it had a very eerie, creepy, kind of like disjointed kind of feel. You know, it was very effective. So, so that was another very successful uh, uh, experiment that we tried and it worked out really well. So, this is All right, now let's move on to the missing toe lady, also led up by Norman Cabrera. Uh, Give us a sort of thumbnail sketch of what the initial design concept uh, was. I know Stephen Gamble was, was the source. Uh, any changes you may have made bringing it into the real world and any challenges you encountered creating that character? So, yeah, like I, I mentioned, as I mentioned earlier, the, the easy part of this was that we had the blueprints. We had, we had the, the starting point all fleshed out. So there was very little guesswork. The biggest challenge again is, is to take something that is that is uh, created artistically on on two dimensional medium and create it in three dimensions as a functioning, operating, practical character. Uh, so, uh, the Tolis Lady was was the Tolis cor Corpse was no exception to that. Um, we we had a wonderful performer, Javier Bardem, playing the the Tolis Corpse. So he was, I mean, anytime you get to work with Javier, it's like such a treat because you've got this incredible human being who can do amazing things with his body and has so far exceeded the dimensions of a human being that it's, it's eerie. You know, it's, it's, really, it's really interesting what he does and how he, how he looks, you know, his, his appearance is, is very interesting. So we had him as our, as our canvas, you know, to, to build this character on. And um, so the challenges were just in, in schedule, getting it done in time, nailing down the paint schemes. Those things are, the, are the, the challenges, which were the same challenges everybody faces, you know, when they're building something. Um, so this was less of a challenge to actually create it on Javier and more of an exciting experience because, you know, we had a creepy, terrifying character. We had a perfect actor and we had Norman Cabrera. To put his signature on it and it's uh in my opinion very very incredibly successful character that uh i think people are going to find terrifying it's it's a scary scary uh character in the film and and the beats that we that we're able to get with with you know javier and andre's direction guillermo's guidance it's going to be beautiful it's really really going to be something special so what can you tell us about the So just to follow up on, on Tolis Corpse, uh, what materials did you use to transform Javier? Was it foam? foam? Was it silicone? What, what can you tell us about the actual construction of uh, that character? Uh, the construction of, of Tolis Corpse uh, for Javier was principally foam latex. Uh, we had uh, foam latex appliances, foam latex uh, uh, extensions on the fingers and, and, and foot appliances, uh, made all made out of foam latex. Foam latex to, to us is still a very viable medium uh, to create what we need to do. I know that silicone has become kind of the standard uh, in the industry and it's a great material, it's very useful, and it has, it has qualities that, that foam doesn't have. Um, but for a character like this, which is very modeled and very you know, decayed and heavily uh, uh, stylized, foam worked out very well. Because as you know, whenever we're watching a character on, on a screen, it's a two-dimensional uh, two image. So we're not standing next to it in person where we can actually d discern, oh, there's depth to that. I can see, you know, translucency. Um, you, can, you can simulate translucency in a very, uh, uh, you know, expertly done paint job. So that reads in two dimensions especially if you had a layer of, of glaze to that on top, it really creates depth and it, and it makes it feel very organic. Foam latex is still something that we use heavily. Um, and uh, so that's what the character was, was mainly comprised of. Um, and uh, you know, she, she had a multi uh, piece appliance makeup that went on, on his face and um, uh, pullover gloves that, that were you know, glued onto the wrists of, of Javier. And then his body was painted and he had a costume that went over that. 
So we, we created all of the elements. So just to dig in slightly deeper, what is what do you love about foam? I, I love the uh, characteristics of foam that it's a very lightweight material. It's very, very pliable. Uh, it has it has great memory, elasticity, and I think it you know it breathes a little bit better than silicone does. When when you put silicone on somebody's face, there's no transfer of air from from the outside world onto the onto the surface of the face. With foam, it's it's a little different because it is a porous material, so there is some some breathability to it. Uh, mainly, it's light. It's very light, and if you formulate it correctly. It's incredibly supple and, and flexible and lifelike. Uh, and even the subtlest facial expression reads on the surface. Um, you know, they're, they're, it's, a, it's a, a, a material that you can very uh, scientifically control its density. So if you need it to be tougher, you can make it tougher. If you need it to be much more uh, supple and light, you can do that. It's highly controllable. Um, it's not the easiest material to work with, but we do have experts that are so dialed into this material they're the scientists of foam latex so you know it makes it makes that part of it kind of a slam dunk for us yeah i'm actually hearing this more and more foam latex is here to stay you know there's there's always that that tendency when there's a bright shiny new toy to play with that people forget the old stuff and what worked great about those but it is nice to see people coming back to using foam a bit yeah. it does when it's painted well and when it's formulated well it's just a fantastic way to build monsters yeah. um Let's let's move on now to one of you know for me personally the scariest character in the trailers I've seen is is Pale Lady standing in that corridor. Uh, what can you tell us about? And I know Mike Hill led up uh, that character. What can you tell us about uh, the design thrills and challenges uh, bringing her to life? So the Pale Lady was a very fun uh, character when you know we, we we'd all seen the pictures of course and thinking about. Bringing that to life was was especially thrilling because it it's especially scary. There's something so weird about it because it has almost a pleasant quality to it, but it's it's wrong. There's something very very wrong about it. It's it's heavy, but it's got really skinny little arms, and its eyes are too far apart, and her mouth is too wide. It's terrifying, <laughs> you know. So that was a really fun one for us, you know. And, and Mike was very, very excited about taking on that challenge. Um, it's it's a pretty massive suit that we built onto uh, um, our actor, Mark Steger. Um, Mark has worked with us in the past quite a bit, and um, he he was uh, he's our demogorgon in scary stories and and. A, 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 few other iconic characters that, that uh, he's brought to life for us. I'm sorry, Stranger Things. Yes, thank you. <laughs> I get those two mixed up all the time. Scary stories, Stranger Things. Two words. Yes. It's the same the to words. me. Yes. Anyway. anyway, they're both terrific. Anyway, uh, so so Steger, Steger is a, a, a Doug Jones-like physique, you know, has that uh, similar uh, proportions. And Pale Lady is you know, five feet wide, you know, so the challenges there were for Mark's performance to be able to, to read through this, this massive amount of material that was, uh, uh, you know, piled onto him. Uh, and, and that, you know, that's Mark's challenge, which he always rises, rises to in, in great fashion. He did a really, really wonderful job making this character come to life. Uh, but as far as uh, technical challenges for us, uh, th there's there's the issue of where the pale lady's eyes are. They're they're too far apart for a human, so we had to create little little uh, peepholes for for Mark to be able to see where he was going. And uh, another challenge that Mike had, Mike Hill, was that there was there was a lot of discussion going back and forth about well, what is what is she wearing? You know, is is it a nightgown? Is it is it her skin? So we were we were. We went back and forth uh, with Andre and Guillermo on this quite a bit, and finally it was decided that we don't know what it is. We don't know if it's her skin or if it's some gown that is fused onto her or what it is, you know, which makes it even creepier, you know, because in the paint job there's sort of like these water stains that have dried and run, you know, it's, it's a very, very terrifying, you don't want to get near this thing, you don't want it to be in, in the same room with you, you know. 
So, so the the way that the thing was built was that so that the, the upper half of it, it all looked fleshy, but it also looked like it might be fabric. And that sort of transitioned down to the part where the, the fabric would come off of her skin and hang, hang freely. So that transition, uh, we made it invisible. So you couldn't tell whether that, that was fabric or, or slothing, you know, flesh or what. So, so that was kind of fun. It was like, it, it made it more ethereal. It didn't make it of this world. It made it a, from another dimension or another uh, uh, place that's, that, that we don't want to look into, you know. Um, so, so I think those were the biggest challenges with her and the biggest thrills with her. Okay, and now the final character I want to ask you about is Jangly Man. Uh, I know, once again, Mike Hill was the lead on that for you. Uh, from what I've seen in the trailers, this is a very agile character. I imagine there was a, a good deal of VFX also required to bring him to life. What can you tell us about Jangly Man and your involvement? So Jangly Man was uh, one of the, the, the only character in the lot that wasn't taken directly from any of Gamel's illustrations. There were, it was sort of an amalgam of a, a lot of different uh, uh, cues that we took from his artwork. And uh, Guillermo and Andre had a team of artists that they were working with prior to coming to us with, uh, to, to build the things. And they had come up with some illustrations for us to look at and, and try to figure out how this character was going to work. So we had a kind of a mind meld moment with Guillermo and Andre uh, uh, with an a actor named Troy James. Troy James, I'm sure you're familiar with who he is. He was on America's Got Talent and made a very big name for himself there. And then now he's been doing a lot of film work. So Troy was our jangly man. And he was the only choice because he's the only guy who can do what he can do with his body, <laughs> which is cre crazy things. <laughs> um, in incredibly uh, limber is, is an understatement. I mean, the guy can turn himself into a puddle instantly right before your eyes so so he was the obvious choice Guillermo had worked with him on the strain and uh so he already knew about him from uh Vancouver or I'm sorry from Toronto Canada and so when we had our earliest meetings we both kind of went it's got to be Troy James Troy James is the guy um so the jangly man is a as I mentioned earlier kind of a combination of a lot of different elements of Gamel's artwork and He's particularly scary because he, um, I don't want to give too much away, you know, if people haven't seen it yet, but, but he's a very uniquely, uh, uh, he has some very unique attributes, um, which I'm sure people will, will pick up on when they see the film. So, so uh, that was a, 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 a challenging character to design because there wasn't like a definitive, you know, this is what it is. And we have to make it look like this. So we had a little more creative freedom, which was fun. It was great. <coughs> um, one of the things that I always... Thank you. What, that I always love about Guillermo is that he... Uh, he does enjoy giving artists license, you know, and, and a sense of ownership in what they're creating. I love the level of, of respect that he has for the people moving the clay around. You know, the, the people who are, are in the trenches building the stuff, crafting it with their hands. So there's there's a, a wonderful uh, sense of, of freedom that comes with that. Um, and, 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 you know, Mike felt it as he, he's, he's worked with Guillermo before. And that's that's something that, that all of our artists enjoy whenever we're working on anything that Guillermo has his hands on. And Andre was the same way. He says, you know, you guys are the experts. You show me what it is and, and we'll go from there. So Jangly Man was, was not only an amalgam of Gamel's work, but he was also an amalgam of all of our creative talents. And uh, he's, he's one, of the, one of the fun ones in the, in the film. He's scary, you know, because it's scary stories, of course, right? So he's gotta be scary. But beyond scary is, you know, there's, there's these deep psychological tendrils that bury themselves in your brain. And that's, that's what this thing does, the, the image of this, the, the the, the pure physicality of it, it's, it's a horrifying experience that I, I'm sure people will remember. Well, it feels to me like all four of these characters 
will have that same resonance with audiences. Stephen Gamble's illustrations are nightmarish and they call back the scariest folklores from our history and I love that the mandate to you guys was to bring the nightmare to life, not, not worry too much about the real world. You can stay in that nightmare world and I think that all four of those characters really feel of a piece and I can't wait to see more. Um, I want to dig a little deeper on what you said about uh, Andre's style and Guillermo's style working with you guys, particularly when things were on set. Uh, what was Andre's um, patience with the process? What was his uh, openness to suggestions about how to make the makeup look best? How was he in that regard? Because some directors know how to shoot it and some don't. <coughs> So, my experience with Andre was strictly in the shop. Give me a second. <coughs> ah, got a little tickle in my throat. <clears> throat> okay. He's still with us. Mike's still okay, with us. I'm still here. <laughs> um, so, so my experience uh, on the project was strictly in the shop. Number one, I wasn't available to travel to set because we're so busy. And number two, the the way that the Canadian uh, structures their their requirements for how many fro, from uh, artists from LA can go to Canada is limited. So it it seemed like a very logical choice to me to send Norman and Mike to the set because they were the guys who had their their fingers on the pulse of all of these characters uh, as closely as anybody. So they were the ones who were there in you know in the uh, uh, on the set with uh, Guillermo and Andre. Um, from what I can see and from what I experienced with him in, you know, here in LA is that he's very patient, he's very methodical, he knows what he wants, and um, he's a very logical director. You know, I love working with guys like that because there's little emotion, very little emotion, except when it's translated onto, onto the screen then all the emotion is poured into that, which I love. I, I don't like drama on set. I don't like dramatic people. I don't like directors who scream. None of that stuff is, is productive, you know. So to have the privilege of working with somebody like Andre, who's so level-headed and so clear, is, is awesome. You know, Guillermo's the same way. He's very passionate. He's very, you know, he's very much a, a, a vivid element on set. <laughs> um, but... But again, he's also, he also approaches the creative process from a very methodical, very technical, and very uh, artistically uh, oriented perspective. So um, what can you say except to reiterate that this was a dream job for everybody involved? Well, I know every single member of the Stan Winston School community cannot wait to see this film and I know they're all so excited that makeup effects plays so heavily in the execution of these characters and that your team was given the right mandate, which was to bring Stephen Gamble's incredible visions, two-dimensional divisions to three-dimensional life and the jangly man uh, inspired by that. So we, we can't wait. Um, so go see scary stories to tell in the dark. Yes. Uh, final question for you, Mike. Um, spectral motion over the last few years has diversified beyond uh, television and film. Can you tell us, I know you've got some top secret stuff in the works, but what can you tell us about, without going into too many specifics, uh, where you see practical effects going uh, from your personal experience diversifying spectral motion? So the, the future of spectral motion is very clear to me and uh, has been manifesting, as you said, over the last several years now. Um, one thing that I do want to mention is that you know, for, for several, years, several years before that, we've been hearing that you know, the death knell of, of, of practical effects is just around the corner. We're, we're going to be phased out. Well, that's not happening and it's not going to happen. It's, it's something that I've, in my entire career, I've experienced that there's always a demand for it. Somebody always walks through our door that says, I want to do as much of this practically as possible. We know that we can use digital effects for, for, for things that practical things can't do, but
but I need the tactile quality of a practical effect. I need my actors to react to something that's there. It's, it's an essential part of filmmaking, and it, I believe it always will be. Um, I might be overly optimistic about that, but I don't think so, because the proof is, is it's in the pudding. Our shop right now is full of practical effects that are being created for future projects. And, uh, and it, it's, it's constantly something that I get phone calls for. How can I do this practically? We need practical effects. We need practical elements. So our, our expansion into other, other areas of, of you know, creative disciplines has enhanced our ability to push the envelope, not only in practical effects, but in robotics and, and AI. We're, we're, we're working with elements of all of those, uh, all of those uh, sciences, technical uh, uh, disciplines, and it's a very exciting time for us. We're, we're finding that we're, we're being offered challenges that, that far exceed where we are right now, and yet a year or two from now, we're at that next, that next level, that next precipice, you know, and we're always ready to jump off. <laughs> <laughs> right into the next, you know, impossible challenge. Um, and, and I see the company growing as a, a multi-tiered uh, creative facility, always rooted in, in the love and passion that we have for monsters, practical effects, and movies, you know, and, and great TV series. That uh, There's so much more content now that, that, you know, many, many avenues are opening up for us to continue to be uh, a leading creative force in the world. Mike, I, I guess I wish you could all see the gleam in this man's eyes. It's so great to see you so excited about the future. And yeah, we have in the past heard the, the naysayers, but I've never believed them either. And uh, as you said, the proof is in the practical pudding. Yes. And absolutely. there's a lot of it going on. So thanks for uh, chatting with us about uh, the project and about Spectral Motion. We can't wait to see what you guys create next. It's my pleasure, man. It's always a pleasure to be with you. Thank you very much for offering me this opportunity. Did it work? Did it work?